<laughs> what? So I remember what India tricked me into this, <laughs> or forced me into giving this talk. And so we said it was going to be on the water cycle, what it is, what's broken, and how to fix it. So first thing we got to do is talk about the water cycle. This is a, just a copy of a page that I got something to talk from off of uh, Alan Savory's Holistic Management book. He's talking about the water cycle. And it's really basic because water evaporates or transpires off the plants. Most of it comes from the seas and rivers and stuff. And then comes down as rainfall or snow. So that's real simple. But when you get into the complexities of it, there's a big portion that's normally retained in the soil. So that is a very important part, is it retains and then it goes deeper. And there's the surface evaporation. If it's bare ground, the sun will heat that and evaporate it. And that becomes, especially in drier climates like ours, or in drier areas, that becomes a very, very important factor because the ground to get into it, it's got to go down. But if you have bare ground, one, it doesn't go in very well. And two, it evaporates at a much higher rate because the temperature goes up. So you need cover on the ground and stuff. So that's how a normal one works. When you're in our area, getting the ground covered under any circumstances can be tough. And if you have years, I've got a photo taken in 2020 with the airport had 5.8 inches of moisture. And you know, that area had much less. So it's nothing grows. But if the if you're looking at this, the water that goes into the ground, it's how fast it gets here is how fast it cycles. The more water that we get going into lakes runoffs or into springs and stuff going down, and if it runs off straight off the land into the waters that get into the oceans, one year increasing the amount of water in the ocean, we've already got enough troubles from global warming from the ocean just increasing inside just because of the heat in the ocean that increases the water and that is that is an additional problem and it also if you have water that's not in the soil stuff you have more in the atmosphere than in the oceans so there's a basically a finite amount of h2o in the world and if this portion that was in the soil ends up in the oceans and stuff, you have more that evaporates off the ocean, so you have more in the atmosphere. Water vapor is a much higher uh, warming gas than CO2. You, know, you get tremendous heat retention of water. Think about when you have a clear night, the temperature goes down. If you have a cloudy night, you might have 10 or 20 degrees warmer. That makes a huge, huge difference in how things go. But this is how it's supposed to work. And part of our problem is, is, is just simply the uh, evaporation and the fact that we're not running, maintaining water in the ground. As your organic matter goes down, the water holding capacity goes way down. I had a field which was my experimental field where I was irrigating. And I was having to get three irrigations to get two very poor soil, to get uh, two crops off of the hay. I changed what I was doing and changed the organic matter from one and a half percent about to four percent. And I went on that field, I was getting two irrigations and getting three crops, which is just, all it was is because I was retaining the water. But it's easy to do if you know what you're doing and pay attention. And, and the good people who are really doing it can do tremendous jobs. But that just shows you what you can do with the, with the soils, but you need water to, to do it. 
So that's the basic water cycle. So is it, how do you change that dynamic? Um, what I did on that case was use a biostimulant, which I used on your fields too. And you know, when Mark first took it over, he said, wow, what did you do over there? Because the ground was dry on his side of the fence and wet on your side because it was rotating water. And over time, that goes away. Because what you're doing, if you stimulate the soil organisms, and the university told me that wasn't possible. And they've got 100 years proving it's not possible. <laughs> but there are ways to play with the numbers. And I don't even know if they really consciously did it, but you can, you can play with the numbers like that. But uh, what, what I did is I changed, in your case, I, I went up from around one and a half to, to about three percent. But I, you know, you gotta spray this stuff on there, it costs five dollars every time you spray it on. So it's, it's not an expensive item, but it, you know, it took my production of quite a bit. What is an example of a biostimulant? Well, it's it's just stuff you buy. There's there's a thousand of them on the market. Where do you get them? You just you you can get it anywhere. Just look up biostimulants. I get stuff called Vitazine, mm -hmm. and it gets in a gallon. And, and the amazing thing is, this stuff. There's there's different ways to do it. I, this is before I knew any other ways. But there's with the biostimulants. You put on one gallon will cover ten acres. Wow. <laughs> so what I'm spraying now is I I mix that with about I put in two gallons of it and spray twenty acres. So I put two gallons into a two hundred gallon tank and spray it out because you gotta have it try to sp split out one gallon mix ten acres. You just can't do it. You can mix, yeah, mix it with water. But that, but to do make it work, you have to have adequate carbon, uh, calcium in the soil, and you have to have adequate uh, phosphate. And the fellow who told me about this said it doesn't work if you don't have adequate calcium. And, and a lot of fields they did when they were proving that the stuff doesn't work was they didn't worry about the calcium. They said, well, calcium is something else. We're just looking at this. And you can play with numbers that way. Because it requires a calcium source. I'm not sure just why, but I suspect it's, it's something to do with the food for the organisms. But there are ways to do it. And now I don't think you'll get the university arguing that, that it doesn't work anymore. This was 15 years ago when we did this. When I first discovered how to do it. But now they, they're going to, we'll get into that later. We'll get into. Soil health, which is a, is a way to keep the, this water cycle going. And if you follow the principles of soil health, you can do the same thing. It's harder to do on, the, say, a garden or something. But this biosimilar that you, you put on is just a few drops and you cover quite a bit of everything. You just mix it in. And it's the same thing as, as uh, nitrogen fertilizer. That's the same effect, really. I can grow, when I'm growing hay, most people when they hit the hot tin. The second cutting around here is straight alfalfa because the grass doesn't grow. My stuff, my grass in the story will be this high, the alfalfa will be this high, so it's it's all there. And so my production is much higher. But, uh, and that's just a, a function of, of having a biostimulant on there, but there's there's, there's good ways to do it that are that benefit the ground much more than what I did. But you know, I, a lot of the, the people said that you couldn't uh, do this when I was doing it. The university wouldn't even talk to me. They, they, <laughs> we were on different pages. They just said no. We didn't this is uh, just a photo I put out. I got from the internet of some farmland and. and what I want to do is show areas where you have the water cycle just isn't working. And if you plow up the ground like this, the water 
doesn't go into the soil here. It stays on the top and just runs off. And think about it when you, there's other experiments, but you can just take take a, a bowl of flour. I got that's my pancakes in the morning. I put milk on it. The milk sits on top of that. It doesn't go into the flour very fast at all. It's not until I mix it that it, the milk and the flour get mixed together. If you just pour, a, take a bowl of flour or some really fine soil, the same, it's the same thing, and just pour water on it, it's going to sit there. It's not going to soak in. And what they do to show this to farmers is they take, for, say, three trays, you know, like a 9 by 14 cake tray type size. And they cut one out of a field like this, and one out of a field that's say no-till or, or something. And then they take one where it's good soil health. They took fields when they did here in Casper. They took one out of one of my fields, my experimental field. They went out and just cut a paint can size out of the field. And then they run a sprinkler over the top. It's a pretty heavy sprinkler that in a few minutes will give you an inch of moisture and put the things on a little bit of a slant in the, in the jar to catch the runoff. The one off the bare field will be very muddy and a lot of water. The one off the no-till will be sort of, it's very cloudy and there's a lot of uh, soil off it, and, but not as much water as the one on the, came off the, this kind of field. And the one that came off of the one that's got a diversity of plants and, and everything else will be clear and not very much water will run on most of it in. And then they take and they turn the pink cake pans over and dump them out. And the one of this is dry on the bottom. There's no moisture. It's just dry and it'll kick up dust frequently. And the one on the that would say that no-till will have some dry parts and some wet parts, and the one where you have the good cover, ground cover, and there's good soil covered, it'll be all wet on the bottom. In fact, the bottom will be muddy if you give it all about the same time. They just do it as a demonstration that this is not good. This is a broken water cycle. So you, you have this problem for, and there's millions of acres done like that in, in this country, hundreds of millions. This is just a picture out my front door, just remind me that, you know, streets, houses, destroy the water cycle. And what we do when it rains, we have drains, I should have taken a picture of the drain. And, you know, when it really poured this summer, it overflowed the drains and went around the houses to the side, on the bottom side of the room. This is a big, you get a big city, say like LA where you have all these streets and cement, you don't, you don't have hardly any lawns or anything in there. There's no place for the water to go. And all our cities are designed to get rid of the water, just channel them down. It's not so bad probably in Casper, because we put it into the Platte River, and it goes to a dam and eventually goes out into irrigated fields. It's not going straight to the river, but if you're in LA, or some place it just goes straight to the LA River, straight there, just trying to get it out of the area because you get floods. So everything is doing that's just examples of, of some of the troubles. And actually in LA they now have a group that's trying to how can we slow the water down? And they're working on the problem. They've got a, there's not much they can do, I don't think, but they're trying to build things that will slow the water and let it suit. Go into the ground. Okay. This is one of the problems that you have. This is a transect that I, I do every few years. And this is one I did in 2020 after the growing season in October. There's a lot of bare ground here and nothing grew. There's, there is some litter here and some sagebrush. But one of the problems is when you don't have to grow or you don't have much water, is it's hard to get ground cover. Very hard. And if you go down and say, look at, at places where they don't allow any grazing, 
and everyone says, well, you just let it go wild. Um, it just north of town here. All the native grasses have died, or virtually died. And you go out there and you look down the fence line on the Soda Lake out here and see where the sagebrush is on the outside of the exposure. It's a two and a half mile exposure, which they put in because they're putting a refinery affluent, or effluent, I mean, uh, out in the lake. And <laughs> when the livestock came in, so in the mid 50s, they fenced that completely, trying to keep them out. They, they did succeed by 60. They, they pretty much succeeded in keeping all the livestock out. So it's been 60 years there or more. But all the native grasses grew out there. There used to be sage grouse strutting around out there. I used to watch sage grouse. They'd be watching birds and swim, scope over, watch the sage grouse for a while, and go back and look for, looking for ducks and stuff. But that area is cheap grass. When I was out there, oh, about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, with Matt Haller, who's the state's best uh, sage grouse expert. Um, he and I would just hop in the fence back and forth. It looked like the, a regular sheep type fence could stop cheap grass. Because there was cheap grass was solid on the stuff where there was no grazing. And you know, whether it was the guy was grazing, whether he was grazing right or wrong, it didn't make any difference. There wasn't that much cheap grass there. So that's just, you know, when you when you don't do any grazing. You can have results when you don't have any rain. You get good result, bad results when you, when you do have some rain. I did this this spring or this June. Here's a, another part of our place. This has got good water. There's no there's no bare ground visible. So you've got grasses and other plants. This is an example of, of probably as good examples we have in the place of, of excellent. Forage, but this is, you know, this is going to have a, a good water cycle because the ground's covered. There's no, when the sun hits it, there's, you know, evaporation is going to be very limited on this. And it's got all the variety and stuff. So, as it, if you have rain, you can do things. And one of the things when you're looking at, at range management and water cycles in the dry area, if you don't have about 16 inches of precip, you can't do this. This is between Castle Mountain and Coal Mountain. It gets more rain than the rest of the area. It gets, snow sits in here because it just drifts in in the winter. There's, in April and stuff, there will still be snow banks in there and it just sits in there. So it gets, it gets adequate moisture. It's not like here where our average is at the airport is 12, 12.6 12 or something like that inches a year. And a lot of that comes to snow. So if you're looking for improving the water cycle and maintaining it, if you do the soil health, you know, I was talking about the, the uh, cover on the ground and stuff. That's the first step, you know, in the soil health. All these are, I don't know there's any, they're all about equal. The USDA is, and the researchers have managed to prove that you can't improve organic matter in the soil for 100 years. They never did all five of these, but they did three of them in various stages quite often. And they never succeeded in getting any organic matter in the soil. If you follow these on good soil with enough moisture, actually grow something, then you can add organic matter about a half a percentage point per year for the, in the top six inches. And the reason we use top six inches is if you've ever replaced a fence post, you know where it rots. That about six, seven inches, that's because that's how far the oxygen goes. So you have very active um, or soil organisms at, at, at down to about six or seven inches. So, for convenience, everybody uses six inches, the top six inches. But there's more organic matter placed below it, but you can do it top six inches. And, and half a percentage point is 
about three tons of carbon per year. In, you know, the, if you do the soil health, the, the cover, you know, you don't want bare ground. Bare ground is really bad. You go back to the plowed field, that's all bare ground. That's all the water is just going on in there. And they've now discovered when they used to leave fields fallow for a year, and they all try to keep all the plants from growing to take the water off, evaporation is uh, just sun hitting bare soil. It's far worse than any the plants have heard. So now they they want growing plants the whole time. And that's slowly, the ag slowly learning that. And they say, limit disturbances. And what they mean by, no. They don't say don't ever plow, because there may be time where you need to plow something. Or you need to disc it for weeds or these things. But limit the disturbance as much as you possibly can. And this means just mechanical, which is the plowing and disking and stuff, or ripping. A lot of people like to rip because then they've got this channel down low. And what they've done is they've killed all the microbial fungi. They just rip through their house. And you, you destroy your soil. Yes, you get water down there, but you destroy all the organisms that are helping you. So that's, that's bad. But also chemical. The good people, Dave Brown, uh, Dave Brandt, others, aren't using any fertilizers or herbicide or uh, pesticides, fungicides, all these things killing the organisms, so they're not doing it anymore. They don't use any fertilizer. And what happens with the fertilizer, the phosphate or the nitrogen is, you put that on the soil and the plant then hits that and says, oh, I've got all the minerals, all I need, which is so it gets lazy, it doesn't put the root exudates down to feed the soil organisms, which means that the soil organisms starve. And you can get all of the nitrogen you need. Gabe Brown doesn't have not used them in I don't know, since probably 20 years now. Hasn't used any fertilizer. So it may not be quite bad. I think he stopped in 2006 was the last time he used fertilizer. But he was doing 5,000 acres, and he's doing better than the county average up there in Bismarck. And he's not putting any fertilizer or any uh, fungicides or pesticides or anything else, and he's beating the county average. But he doesn't have any of these costs. Result is, is his cost per corn, he told me, was $1.78, I think he said, average over a 10-year period. This is a couple of years ago one of his talks. And his neighbors were having trouble making the ends meet at four dollar corn. And he was saying, four dollar corn, if you're not making more than two dollars a bushel. <laughs> you know, that's profitable. What are you talking about? It's hard. And his soil is better. And he's and he's increased stuff. And the other thing they do is is build diversity. You know that photo I showed you of the grass and the and the plants. The more diversity you have in the soil, the better it is. That's what, look at the rangelands, especially if you get a lot, say, in the sand hills or someplace in Nebraska, where you have more water than you do here. There isn't just one plant species of plant. There's 20, 30 species. And that's what Gabe said when he, when he looked at his rangelands around Bismarck, North Dakota, he said, you know, the way it was designed, he said, it's, look at all the species. He doesn't use one, so he goes to, you know, we used to rotate crops. When you go back to the textbooks when I was in school, they talked about crop rotation and stuff. You talk, you look at what uh, Jefferson or Washington were doing back in the 1700s. They were promoting crop rotation. We got out of that because we saw that with fertilizers and chemicals. But if you go through as much diversity as you can, it's better. What they did in North Dakota is they did an experiment, a small experimental plot by the conservation service up there. And they did all these different species, and then they did one plot with all, they did six plots, I guess, six species. And they did one plot with all of them, and they had a very dry period for them. And the one plot with the six species was all growing in 
and doing very well, all of the crops were like you would expect in bad drought. They weren't doing well. And the result is that if you have different species getting there, they all work together. And uh, some of it is far more than the parts. So you need to build your diversity as best you can. And they're always doing it. Every area is different. And what my problem with haying was nobody really knows how to do it with haying because all the work has been done in row crops. So, you know, what species will work and what don't. We, we come close to it just because we have grasses and alfalfa and weeds. But the weeds were a problem for me that I had no trouble with. They say keep living roots in the soil. Think back to the uh, picture of the plowed ground. There's no living roots there. They'll have foul ground over the winter. That just, you know, the soil organisms are either dying or they're, but they're not producing. There's no roots for it to feed them or anything else. So you have, that's a serious, serious problem. And if you go to places <coughs> Where, they're have, where they have uh, plowing and, and other things, and really good cropland, they're all losing their organic matter. Part of it is they're not keeping living roots, they're not following any of these. And the fifth one here, which is as important as any of the others, I don't think there's anything that's, any one of these, if you don't do one of them, you're just not going to do well. You can make, if you do four of them and not five, you can probably not be mining carbon, but you still won't be adding carbon. And if you integrate animals into the system, well, that's what it, that's how everything was here was designed. All the soils were designed were massive herds of buffalo, and you go before buffalo, you had ground sloths, so you had all sorts of, of other animals here, you know, predators and everything else. They chew up, if they have hooved animals, they'll chew up the ground as the herd goes through. They eat everything there, and then they allow it to recover. But you had animals defecating on the ground. You had them urinating on the ground. That's recycling all the nutrients. You had them dying on the ground. Everything recycles the nutrients here. You feed the animals. All the soil organisms are used to have. If you don't have animals there, you start from And you've got to figure out how to do it. In, in a garden, maybe your animal is going to be an earthworm because you can't do anything else. It would be nice to have cows and chickens, but if you have a garden that's half the size of this room, you can't do any of that. So you've got to do something. But you, you've got to have it. And if you look at areas, you know, you have some puddle out here, the Soda Lake, north of town here is a good example with a very limited number of animals. If you have, there's a few animals out there, and that's it. Um, the, the native plants die. If you go look, say, down some of the monuments in Utah and stuff, where they've excluded, you get a national monument down and they've excluded all the animals, you have this bare soil that has nothing growing on it, that's eroding, etc. Yeah, it's pretty to look at. But it's a non-functional water cycle, completely non-functional. You have ranches that aren't very far away from there that are doing good grazing techniques that have grasses growing. Um, and you can do it with animals are just a huge tool. If you take it away, there's a real serious problem, but you've got to manage it. You can't just let them go out there before they were managed by predators, but if you remove the predators, <coughs> then you have the, the problems that there's a fellow down in, in Mexico in the Sonoran Desert. He's got the photos of the Apaches down there standing in the grass like this on their horses. So it's taken 1890s or something, I guess. It's before the European version of grazing came to that area. 
and it's just great grassland. Now it's a desert, desert not much more growing than, than this room. And it's eroding, it's bare soil, it's heating the atmosphere, there's no water cycle there, and he's taken by using his animals right and actually following all the soil out the country schools, but he was using animals as raising them right down there. And he's returned to grasslands. And his first name is Alessandro. His, his last name starts with a C. But he's done wonderful things down there in the Sonoran Desert. But you can do that. He's restored the water cycle, he's got springs flowing. Um, Alan Sabri, he's got a, a uh, video out there on a TED Talk. If you do TED talk, Talks, you can search it for Alan Sabri on grazing, and he talks about Africa, where he came from. He, he was, grew up in Rhodesia. Um, he talks about doing the grazing right in that area and actually destroying the water cycle. He's got a small place, 19,000 acres or so, somewhere in southern Africa. And I'm not sure just where it is. You'd have to Google it to find it. He's now got that area, he's had it for maybe 20 or 30 years. But he's got that area where the grasses have come back. He has trouble showing people elephants and stuff now because instead of having one water hole in the whole place, where everything goes to. There's all sorts of water hill. The water is now, this is an area which gets, I think it's 20 or 30 inches of rainfall, but they, it all comes in a couple months. Then it's a hot, dry months for nine, 10 months of the year. But he gets this tremendous grass growth and then he beats it down. He has a, he does all of these four, plus he integrates animals into it properly, which is, Raising and allowing the plants to recover before you raise it again. And he's done all that, and he's restored the water cycle, which is just, you know, his neighbors in Africa, they're still, they have, you know, a lot of bare ground, they, they don't have a, a viable water cycle, it's a flood, it's feast or famine the whole time, and he's got these grasses and stuff. But you can do that with this stuff. So if you follow all of these soil health principles, you end up, you'll end up with a water cycle that works. And it does a, a lot of things, including limiting the amount of water that is elsewhere, because we put a lot of it in the soil, which gets transpired from the plants. So you get smaller uh, things. And here's a statement I've read, and, and I've got, had a lot of, talked to a lot of people who, are looking at, everyone says it's probably correct. And that is it's just a phenomenal statement to me of what we've done to this plant. If we could, you, you hear on the news, there was a thing on the news today about sequestering, they can, they can sequester, I don't know how many pounds of carbon it is, it's a huge cost. If you actually were to do this and get oh, the whole country in here, you could, you could, the whole world, you could do a lot of good for, for the whole country in this stature. And there's two advantages to doing this. You know, you talk about the industrial way of taking carbon out of the air and, and how co costly this is, just cost them spending millions of dollars on it. If a farmer does this, gets his organic matter up, then he has to pay the government because he's, he's going to make money. He's, he's reduced his expenses. He's, and the other thing he's done is he's increased the value of the food. If you think of all the food that we're producing now from our factory situation, the uh, thing I, I read a thing is some of the foods that are losing have 20% of the minerals and nutrients they had 50 years ago or 60 years ago. It's just, you know, the, the new.
nutrient capacity for plants is bad. And I read of the, Dr. Williams, who's probably the, the top guy in grazing in the country, um, said that grass-fed beef, if you take that as 100% nutrients, is very nutrient-dense package. If you take uh, stuff that came out of the feedlot, that's half the nutrients. If you take lab-grown meat, it has around 15%. And the, the grass-fed beef, because of the way they have to get it edible, you have to follow the soil health principles to have enough food to, to do it. You end up sequestering carbon. And one of the things, when you, when you think about sequestering carbon, the reasons I say that, that this statement is probably correct is that say you take the corn acres in the U.S. There's around 90 million corn acres in the U.S. If you go and do the calculation on what uh, organic matter is in the carbon. The soil weighs per acre, the top six inches weighs about two million pounds. One percent of that's 20,000 pounds or, or 10 tons. About five eighths of organic matter is carbon. So you're talking about six and a quarter tons of carbon for a 1% increase in organic matter or in organic matter in soil. If you can increase that at half a percent a year in the top six inches, then you're, you're adding per acre about three tons. If you multiply that times 90, you're, 90 million, you're talking about 27 million tons of carbon sequestered per year just if you just did the corn acres. If you do that for the probably it's now about one percent or one and a half there. If you put two and a half percent more and that's five years of five times that is uh, about a million and about a hundred and uh, thirty five million tons of carbon sequestered just in the corn acres. So, yeah, this is probably a very valid number. And the question is, how do you get there? But this is, to me, is that we now know what you have to do. To get there, you, and if you can take the water cycle and improve that all, you end up improving everything else. Because everything builds off the soil and up. And it's possible you just have to educate people. But this is, to me, is a, is, very encouraging sign that we've reached this stage where the experts are saying, yeah, that's probably correct. But intensively farmed, you know, all the little farms through Africa and Asia and stuff, if you just took all that, most of them have depleted the soil. And that's that's a real serious problem for the whole world is you know, if you destroy the water cycle. Done just to a phenomenal degree. We've, we've increased it, it's going on, we've increased the water in the seas, we've increased the water in the atmosphere coming off the oceans because that's where the water is and uh, not coming slowly up through the soil the way it should be. So that's, that's my spiel. <laughs> any, any questions? How do you maintain diversity in something like a big cornfield? Um, um, just parts of it. What they do is you can plant cover crops in it, and they say the cover crops, because of the timing to, to get them right, takes about 20% of the production from that. I'm not sure that is a long term loss, but they do 20%. They put, they'll put cover crops in and then graze livestock on the cover crops. So now you've, you've met a whole lot of those principles. And, and then they still have to plow the whole field to plant. No, no, they don't plow. They, they've almost, there's a lot of fields now that go to no till. And it's the weeds that they have to, that's, that's a, a big problem. There, there are people who are good at it, uh, Dave Brandt in Ohio, uh, Gabe Brown in North Dakota and others, have solved that. They no longer 
worry about the weeds, just wait and step. The crown of weeds is what they've done. I, I think for a while it, it takes you, a, I've, I've told you five to ten years just to be able to rotate out of industrial life to a soil health. And, but they also have found that with it warming up, they can do the corn and then they can put in a, another crop, winter wheat crop, something else to have cover and growing plants on the soil. They can do that. There's all sorts of ways to do do it. That some of them plant in the fall of September or something. They get these. I, mean, I don't know how they do it, but they get machines to run down the corn rows and plant between the corn. You can do it. You can plant it at the same time as the corn. You can plant it after that. There's there's lots of ways to do it, and if you if some of your uh, plantings are a legume, whether it be peas or alfalfa or a clover, so a lot of them talk about various clovers that they plant that aren't going really to be very high, then you can do it. You can also plant, if you're doing other plants, that have been experimenting with taking like a grain and doing planting stuff that has different size seeds. So then you harvest it all, then you just sort the seeds. And this is stuff they can do. So they get two or three. You can you can do it that way, double cropping and stuff. In a lot of places, double crop already. Yeah. But if they they just have to do it, they have to get off this corn over corn over corn over corn, or, or soybeans over soybeans over soybeans over soybeans, you know, or three years of corn and a year of soybeans or something. And, um, there's there's ways to do it that, that some of the good people are doing when they plant their corn. Instead of planting in rows like this, they're planting rows like that. Just the plant row is much thicker with the corn. They're not reducing their production any, but they're having this more sunlight getting into their uh, cover crop. And they're, so they're, they're doing it. There's there's peculiarities because I, I'm not a row crop farmer. I, I don't. I just read about it and stuff. Yeah. I. But the good people. Dave Brandt was one of the people in. Uh, you know, he was somewhere in Ohio. I can't remember where. He just died this year. But he he discovered it a long time ago. And Dave Brandt. Oh, I forgot one cycle on the slide. I got, here's some, some sources I've, I've talked about, some books. This is a fascinating book, The Life Game. I'll do this Schwartz. She's got some other ones out there. Just go to the YouTube. Uh, Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, Christine Jones, you can talk about, is the one that talks about uh, fertilizers and soil health. She goes into a great deal of stuff of what actually happens in the soil. And she's got some, she's from Australia, and she's got some absolutely wonderful <coughs> photos of places that, that did things very well. And one of them is of a ranch where they split it up. Two brothers inherited it. They split the place up. And one brother stepped going the traditional way of grazing the way he was doing. And his brother went Christine Jones's way with soil health and grazing right and stuff. And the brother who's on the traditional one kept telling his other brother, you got to graze more cattle, you're leaving too much. And he says, I'm already grazing more than you are. I'm not even some plants. Because <laughs> the only way of grazing was if you left a, a plant, and this is what I, what was the common philosophy when I started here in the 50s, water looking at rangelands and stuff. And if you left a plant on the soil, you hadn't done a good job of grazing. And that, <laughs> you know, that was the that was the belief, that was what it was taught. You know, and you know, those plowed fields. I was always trying to take the you still read a lot of the soil stuff that says if you don't have a good seed bed, then you can't the plants won't sprout. They found that's not true. But it's still taught that you've got to have a nice, smooth seedbed to plant plants. And that's still probably.
probably most of the farmers still think in those terms. You've got to have the seed bed preparation. So you've got to plow it, you've got to disc it, you've got to pack it, do all the stuff, get the seed bed. And they found it in no-till drills and stuff. They don't really need it. But there's, that's still fun. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, but these are, these are fascinating if you, if you want to look at the subject. Dave Brown's book, Dirt and Soil, is a, it's a very easy read. And it's just absolutely fascinating. Um, he talks about how he went from, because he, he grew up in the city, he married a farm girl, and he wanted all this one farm. So he eventually bought his in-law's place, and then his in-law had never bought uh, hail insurance. He got wiped out three years in a row by hail. And that got him to think, he in the first place, he didn't have much money. So he couldn't put fertilizer on because he couldn't afford it. He, he had to do with what he had. And the soil, the, uh, not soil conservation, Conservation District up there, it's part of USDA too. Had a fellow, a J. Fur or something like that. F. F. U. H. R. I think his name is. Um, who said, well, you know, you know, there's better ways to do this. And the guy that was, a, I think he's the genius in North Dakota. There's a bunch of guys who followed him, who were doing it. But he just pointed out, look at the rangeland and stuff. Look, look what else is out there. So Gabe was able to do it with 5,000 acres. Now, people say, well, you can't do it with a lot of acres, but he did it with 5,000. And you know, he, he's making a huge amount of money, and so is the government. But he's sequestering carbon. His, his property went from around 1.5% one, one organic matter you know, up to 6 or 7%. Just by doing that, and he, you know, he no longer spends money, and he no longer accepts any money from the federal government. Most farmers are living. The reason they can make a go of it four dollar corn, and corn is down that little though it's now about seven dollars per bushel. But the reason they make more is because the federal government subsidizes it. So he's, he weaned himself off that subsidy because his crop got wiped out, and he didn't have insurance. He didn't get the substance that other people would get. So he had to do these different things. He doesn't believe in getting money from the federal government. He's a, that's a really fascinating book. You don't, if you don't read anything else out of that, that's good. But Gabe Brown has YouTube where he says the same stuff. It's, it's fascinating. Ray Archuleta has got some really good stuff. Christine Jones' stuff out there on the internet is really fascinating. <laughs> Alan Savory's book is, is very important, but it's it's a hard read. You, you, you have to want to read that. <laughs> that's that's a, it's an interesting read for a rancher. <laughs> I'm not as convinced that it, the information is there and it, it's good. And he's a genius. So. How are you? I started out this uh, view is just doing the biostimulant because I wanted to increase the organic matter. And then I, a few years ago, I, I got to meet Dave Brown and hear him speak. I've, I've been to, to two of his talks. And it was, it's, it's an eye opener. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced I've I did some diversity down. I'm just farming a little field right now. I'm retired, but I'm just farming 34 acres. And I planted, I went for diversity, I planted in grasses, uh, turnips and radishes in that field. And I'm still, I did that, I replanted that four years ago, five years ago, five years ago, probably. And I'm still seeing the difference. Last year, the guy couldn't get the water on until the middle of July. In a year when there wasn't enough water in them. Right here, if you grow a dry crop, it's, it, you just can't do it. But I've got as much production off that field as ever. And he only got one irrigation on it. 
And uh, so that's a, that's a, an example of, of uh, just putting it in reverse. And if, you have, if you're trying to feed horses or cows or something, you can put it in terms of that. I should say that. Like <laughs> and that, those, they're just a phenomenal change. Uh, I've seen, just from what I did there, I've, it's got weeds and weeds. It's got fine weeds, which I'm really not sure how to get rid of them. And it's got uh, one, two, three, four, four kinds of grasses. And I planted some different kinds of legumes. The only thing that survived right now is, is alfalfa. But when I planted it, I planted turnips and radishes, and I misjudged them. Settings on the planter, and when I walked across that field, you could not take a step without stepping on at least one radish or two. It just wasn't, you know, and they were thick. And then he doesn't allow livestock in there, so I can't, I can't follow all the principles as well as I would like. I have to do other things, but uh, they just watered the ground. If you have livestock in there, they manage to get them out and chew them up immediately. So then you get manure out. But the bees, they just ride them in the ground. Man, you talk about putting organic matter in the ground. It just, it, I have had fertilizer in that four or five years, and I just got the, with the water this year, I managed to get the highest production of ever gotten off the field. So the radishes and turnips just decayed in the just ground? Just decayed in the ground. ground. And, and it just improved. And, you know, last year when he had them irrigated, we went and uh, cut it and stuff, and then he did get here again. But I got, as I say, an average, or a little better than average, I was about the third or fourth best beer I'd ever had on the field. And that's what I here in the middle of July. I think it was 16th or 17th of July before we put in water. And, and he has trouble with his ditch. He's down in the best for Ben, and he comes off the Speedy's fish hatchery. But he's at the end of the ditch, and he has Ditch goes through sand. <laughs> so the water starts out and gets a couple of feet of turnout. And by the time it gets a mile down the ditch to him, or three quarters of a mile, there isn't much left. So he has real trouble getting enough water. It takes him 30 days just to go over the 34 acres. Or so I was irrigating over the fields of the ditch, which I could set it up so they could irrigate 15 days or 10 days. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, I'm really convinced on the university. It just makes a huge difference. It's, uh, but the, the good people, I'm not a row cropper, so I, I, I don't know the details of how they do things, but they're definitely if Gabe Brown, Dave Brandt, and a bunch of others who I don't know can do what they've done without fertilizer. But now you, you look at the amount of fertilizer they put in all the water, all the fertilizer that goes to the Gulf of Mexico and stuff. Real serious trouble. We don't really need to be doing that. We, we can do it other ways. And it's a lot cheaper. And it ends up because you, then you get the nutrients back. But, you know, if you go to the store, you can't buy a plant. Stuff. You can buy organic, pay more for it, but they aren't doing this all the soil health. There's nothing there that says all they can't do is do the chemicals. They can't use commercial fertilizers, they can't use pesticides, which is good, but it's not the whole story. They haven't got the diversity in there. They haven't, they're still plowing, they're, you know, so they're still doing the disturbance. They're not covering the ground, they're still got fallow ground, and they're trying to get rid of weeds and stuff. There's, there's ways in there that they're just not doing. So there's still, you know, when Dave does the study of soils beside this place, he did an organic soil, his soil, and then a conventionally farmed out there. Conventionally farmed and organic had the same biological activity in the soil. And then he was an order of magnitude about them. He the amount of stuff. He showed a picture of one meeting that I went to taken sub-zero temperatures. His fields were green and girl. His neighbors were snow covered. 
And that's just the difference in the biological activity too. But he's he's an exception. He's probably a genius at doing what he's doing. But it's uh, it's fascinating. But the water cycle is where everything starts. You've got to get the water cycle. To do that, you've got to have the soil health, and that just builds. Do you ever read the Scotland? That's, that's an interesting uh, yeah. I haven't read that. Oh, hold on. Oh, Stock and Yeah. Is that Alan Nations? It was. He passed away. Oh, yeah. And I just read that every day. I read that every month. I was thinking of, of another one. Yeah. No, I, I read that one. Yeah, that's fine. The fall of Virginia now, right? It's right. not that or Virginia's Yes, the front page, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's the stock of Gretchen. Yeah. I know that. I haven't read this much. It just came. They sell some stuff in that called Mike Ward. Mm -hmm. They advertise it. I wonder if that's a bio I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. It's specifically aimed at increasing yeah. mycorrhizal fungi. Yes, yeah. Mycorrhizal fungi are really fascinating because they're just long filaments, miles long, that when the, the plant sends down the exudates, which is basically a carbon-based sugar, it feeds the plants and somehow tells it, I need water, I need phosphate, I need whatever, and the mycorrhizal fungi trace it. It's so it's it's all interconnected. It's yeah. We we don't know enough about the soil yet. It's so complex, and our way of looking at trying to isolate everything, you know, just do one thing. It, it doesn't study soil because it's too complex. I think rangeland is in, in the similar boat. It's too complex. You study you very hard to just study one factor. It's just too. There's too much. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. We appreciate it. You're supposed to say what's next month, but I don't.